Welcome everyone. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce Emine Kisaritaş for this talk today. So Emine Kisaritaş graduated from BS degree in electrical and electronics engineering from Bilkent University in 2002. And she pursued her graduate studies at Stanford University at the Department of Electrical and Technical Engineering. Then she received her MS and PhD degrees in 2004 and 9 respectively. Later, she joined the Department of Bioengineering at the University of California, Berkeley, as a Civil Stem Cell Institute postdoctoral fellow. And she has been a faculty member at Bitcamp University since September 2013. She is the recipient of multiple awards, including Young Scientist Outstanding Achievement Award, Young Scientist Award, an Incentive Award, Distinguished Teaching Award, and today's talk the title of today's talk is Magnetic Particle Imaging for Radiation Free Functional Imaging. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk. It's always a pleasure. So, my talk today is about a new medical imaging model called Magnetic Particle Imaging. Uh, I actually gave a talk in this exact same room two years ago as part of maybe the same seminar series. So, some of you may be familiar with some of the things that I will explain today. Uh, but I will also add what has happened since the past two years, uh, both in uh, MPI field in general, also in my lab at the moment. Um, so currently we have many different imaging modalities, uh, including anatomical imaging modalities such as computed tomography and magnetic resonance imaging, and also functional imaging modalities such as positron emission tomography. Uh, magnetic particle imaging, as I've said, is a new imaging modality. It does not provide any signal from the human anatomy itself. It only gives signal uh, from the uh, nanoparticles introduced into the human body as tracers. Um, so it's more of a functional imaging modality, although you could also do anatomical imaging of the blood vessels with MPI. Um, so MPI has ideal positive contrast, similar to positron emission tomography, where radio guides are uh, in, introduced into the body. Uh, there is no background signal that uh, makes an MP, MPI a high contrast imaging modality. The signal that we get is proportional to the concentration of the iron oxide nanoparticle tracers that we introduce into the body. The main advantages are uh, it has high resolution, no ionizing radiation, unlike positron emission tomography where radioactive materials are used. And the tracers that we use, which are iron oxide nanoparticles, are safe uh, for use in humans. And here I've displayed some applications of MPI, but I will briefly go over them in the following slides. Uh, the overall goal of MPI is to address clinical needs that cannot be solved by the existing imaging model. MPI is a rapidly, imaging, rapidly developing imaging modality. On the left, we see the first ever MPI image that was published in 2005. What we see in this image is the bright uh, spots, high intensity parts in the image, are where we have the nanoparticles uh, in this imaging phantom. Uh, whereas today, the resolution, uh, contrast sensitivity has all improved uh, for MPI, so we have much better looking images. Uh, I want to emphasize MPI is not MRI. Unfortunately, their acronyms are very similar. They, are, they both use magnetic fields, but uh, imaging hardware and imaging principles are completely different for MPI. Um, what is similar is that MPI is experiencing a very rapid development right now, similar to the development MRI has experienced in the 1980s. But there are still many potential advances in hardware image processing the nanoparticles that we use for imaging as well as applications. And so, since this is a relatively new imaging modality, I want to first mention who is currently working on MPI. Uh, MPI was first invented by two engineers working in Philips. Uh, so Philips is working on MPI. Uh, but Philips is uh, a company that makes human size imaging systems, uh, whereas if you have a new imaging modality, you want to start with animal-sized systems, which are both easier to implement, and also you want to see if there are any potential side effects first 
uh, on small animals. So they have collaborated with Bruker, a small animal imaging company, one of the most successful ones in the world. And they have already uh, installed six preclinical scanners, mostly in uh, universities uh, in Europe. There is also a startup company which is a spin-off uh, from UC Berkeley uh, called Magnetic Insight. They have also already sold four clinical, preclinical imaging scanners. Obviously, there are also universities and research labs working on these systems, but an important point is that so far there is no human-sized commercial scanner yet. Uh, first, the preclinical side needs to be demonstrated with uh, all potential applications and the safety aspect as well, and then uh, the human applications will emerge, hopefully. And I want to start with uh, a brief uh, information about the principles of MPI. I gave a Turkish talk recently, so some of my slides have been translated to Turkish in certain parts. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so this is a schematic of a typical MPI scanner. The hardware is different than MRI because in MRI we have a very large static magnetic field that's homogeneous inside the imaging board. Here we have the reverse of that. We have a, a gradient type magnetic field uh, which ramps up linearly from one side of the scanner to the other. Uh, you can imagine these as two uh, magnets uh, facing each other with, uh, with the same uh, poles such that they create a field-free point at the center of the scanner system. Uh, we take signal from this field-free point only, from the nanoparticles at the field-free point only, and by sweeping this field-free point in space, uh, we can acquire 3D images of the underlying nanoparticle distribution. Uh, the nanoparticles that are used are superferromagnetic iron oxide nanoparticles that are known to be safe for use in humans. And their typical core sizes are from somewhere from 17 to 25 nanometers. Here I'm showing a TEM image of these nanoparticles. So what happens when you place these nanoparticles in the MPI scanner is first of all, um, these nanoparticles have a nonlinear magnetization curve. If the applied field exceeds a certain value, the magnetization uh, of the nanoparticles saturates in both directions. So if I place nanoparticles at the field-free point, uh, they will start from zero magnetization. And if I apply a time varying AC magnetic field on top of this static field, the particles at the center will experience uh, saturation in both positive and negative di directions. Now the signal that we get is inductively received, so we get the time derivative of this magnetization as signal in MPI. <coughs> If you compare that to the response of nanoparticles placed closer to one of the coils, now they, have, or they are already starting at a, a high magnetic field point, so they are already saturated. Applying an AC field on top of this DC field doesn't change the magnetization of the nanoparticles, and the time derivative of this is now zero. So we get signal only from nanoparticles in the vicinity of the field. And here's an example MPI image uh, from an MPI scanner. So there are two disk uh, magnets in the scanner, one on this side and one on the other side. Here's a uh, so-called phantom. This mimics uh, the blood channels in the human body. Imagine injecting iron oxide nanoparticles into the blood vessels and imaging them with MPI. Uh, we see that, for example, in this particular location, there, there was a small air bubble, so uh, there were no nanoparticles. In the corresponding MPI image, we can also see that there is no signal at that part of the channel, uh, which means you could detect occluded blood vessels, for example, using MPI. <laughs> One of the things that makes MPI really special, in my opinion, is the fact that you can change the performance of your imaging system simply by changing the nanoparticles that you are using. Uh, a nanoparticle that saturates more quickly to applied magnetic field gives you higher resolution MPI images because even a slight distance from the field free point will now saturate the nanoparticle. You will have higher resolution images. Uh, so here, this is an experimental comparison of Resolist, which was the first ever particle used in MPI. It's actually made for uh, to be used in MRI as a contrast agent versus a tailored SPIO. 
which has higher core size, uh, which saturates more quickly essentially, and we see the corresponding images. Uh, they have the same iron concentration in these channels, uh, but there is about 37% improvement in resolution and also three times more signal for the same iron amount. Now, the iron amount here is important because you are injecting, you will be injecting these into human subjects. Uh, you don't want to load them with unnecessary amounts of iron. Um, so it's important to have high signal uh, for the same iron content. So just by changing the nanoparticles that you are using for the same MPI system, you could improve both your resolution and the SNR. Currently there are two different imaging uh, image reconstruction schemes used in MPI. One of them is the system function reconstruction. Here, typically, a two-dimensional or three-dimensional trajectory is used to sweep the field three-point FFP in space. And then you take calibration measurements first. For example, you divide the imaging field of view into grids, and then you position a point source in one of the grids and apply your trajectory, the magnetic field that generates this trajectory. Then you record the signal, take the Fourier transform of it, place it in a so-called system matrix. Then you repeat this entire procedure by putting the point source in the next position in your grid. So if you have a 40 by 40 grid, you do this uh, 1,600 times at all positions, record the signal, put it into the system matrix, and that becomes your large matrix S over here. And then this, the next step is to perform uh, imaging. You place whatever you want to image in the field of view, run the exact same trajectory, record the signal, put it uh, as a vector u on this side, and try to determine at what locations uh, the nanoparticles were. So you are going to solve this inverse problem in this case. The problem with all this procedure is the length of this calibration. Uh, right now it takes around 24 hours to perform this calibration uh, on an MPI scanner. Uh, the second uh, very popular image reconstruction technique is called X-space uh, reconstruction. Here no calibration is needed. Uh, you take the signal uh, at a given instant uh, from the coils. Uh, we know the location of the field free point at that time instant. So essentially we are mapping the signal back to the position of the field free point. But we need to do some intermediate corrections. Now the most important correction here is to compensate for the speed of the field free point because if you are sweeping the field free point faster because we are doing inductive reception, we will get higher signal purely because of this speed, so we have to compensate for it. But once you do that, essentially the image that you are going to get by reading the signal back to the position of the field free point is a version of the nanoparticle distribution convolved by a point spread function, the point spread function of your system. So here's an example shown for this nanoparticle distribution. If you convolve it with the point spread function, this will be the corresponding X space MPI image. If you compare this to system function reconstruction, in system function reconstruction, it is essentially doing all the deconvolution for you taking care of all the system response, whereas here it's integrated into the image, but you can always do further processing on this image to improve your resolution. And this is a schematic showing a demonstration of um, X-space reconstruction. Here, this uh, circle is the field free point. We are sweeping it in space and assume that this is our nanoparticle positioned at the center. That this again, position at the center. As I change the location of the field free point, the nanoparticle is aligning back and forth, back and forth, and generating some MPI signal. I know the position of the field free point, I grid that signal in space, and I get this blurred version of the nanoparticle distribution as my MPI image. So these are the basics of MPI. I want to uh, now talk about uh, some of the emerging applications of MPI that have been demonstrated recently. Uh, one of the most important potential applications is stem cell tracking with MPI. So these iron oxide nanoparticles can be placed inside of stem cells. Uh, you know stem cells are being used for, um, uh, to, they are being injected into the body so that they can go to the damaged 
uh, site in the human body and have repaired that site for tissue regeneration essentially. But we would like to track where these stem cells are going uh, and what they are doing at that location. So imagine uh, placing iron oxide nanoparticles into the stem cells and then placing them into the body that way. We would be able to track where the stem cells are going uh, from the signal coming from the nanoparticles. And this is a comparison showing uh, MPI. So these were nanoparticles and fluorescent probes both inserted into the stem cell. So stem cells also give fluorescent signal in this case. But in the case of optical imaging, depending on the depth where the stem cells lie, uh, the fluorescent image uh, can be misleading. If the stem cells are closer to the surface of the body, they will give a bigger signal, whereas if they are deep down, they will not give the same amount of signal. So this may be confused for having different number of stem cells in two different locations. Another comparison was performed here using MRI. In MRI, iron oxide nanoparticles perturb the magnetic field, so they generate what is called negative contrast. They reduce the amount of signal that's normally coming from the tissue. Um, so we can see here that in different locations there are very SPIOs that generated uh, black regions in the image, but other things can create a signal void in MRI, such as presence of air. So it's really difficult to tell that there were SPIOs, stem cell, uh, SPIOs in stem cells at that location. Whereas over here, here, the color part is the MPI image. The background image is coming from CT, and MPI does not have any anatomical image by itself, so you could use a secondary imaging modality for anatomy. But we can clearly see that there were two different locations, and they had similar amounts of stem cells in them. Another application that has been demonstrated is cancer imaging with MPI. Uh, cancerous tissue have a property called enhanced permeability and retention. So ca cancerous tissue, the, the blood vessels around cancerous tissue is leaky. Whatever you have in the blood vessel, even if it wouldn't normally make it into the tissue for intact uh, healthy tissue, uh, the, blood, the blood vessels near cancerous tissue are leaky, so all the material le leaks into the blood vessel. Cancer wants to see if there is anything useful in that blood essentially, and then retains it for a much longer time than a healthy tissue would retain that material. This property has been uh, taken advantage of in many different imaging modalities, not just MPI, but this is an example for MPI. Um, so here, uh, this is a mouse study, a cancerous tissue was inserted in, into the mouse body, and then uh, iron oxide nanoparticles are injected. We see that in about four hours after injection, so this material is circulating in the blood, in the blood, so the cancer is taking more and more of it as time evolves. Uh, the cancerous tissue has start, it starts to light up, and we see that it reaches a peak signal amplitude around 24 hours post-injection, and then cancer eventually releases all that material, so the signal goes uh, a few days after injection. So this is a time graph of that. But important point here is that the background tissue does not retain uh, the same material, iron oxide material, for that long, so we can distinguish the cancerous tissue from the remaining healthy tissue and uh, using MP. There has also been recent, very recent studies about targeted cancer imaging with MPI. Uh, so you can coat the surface of your nanoparticles uh, with chemicals that target tumors. In this case, lactoferrin uh, was coated on top of the nanoparticles. And this is a chemical that targets brain uh, tumor, glioma essentially. And so these were injected into uh, mouse once again. In this case, this is the control, the reference study. Uh, the tumor was over here. Only normal SPIOs were injected, nothing lights up in this region. What lights up here is the liver. Eventually, all the iron goes into the liver and is processed there, so there is a large MPI signal coming from the liver. Uh, in this case, lactoferrin was conjugated with the SPIOs, and we see that there is more signal in the tumor region. On top of that, a magnet was placed behind that region, so that increases the uptake of iron oxide in uh, cancer location. A very recent 
and an exciting application area of NPI is targeted and focused hyperthermia with NPI. These are nanoparticles you know, particles have many different applications. One of the applications is if you apply a high frequency magnetic field, the magnetization of the iron oxide uh, is delayed with respect to the applied field, so that in turn creates uh, heat around the nanoparticle. This hysteresis behavior uh, manifests itself as heat around the nanoparticle. So it can be used for, for example, uh, increasing the local temperature around tumor and killing the tumor tissue. This is called hyperthermia. Um, what is shown in this study is that we can detect the location of the nanoparticles using MPI and the concentration at one location will directly correlate with how much that location is going to heat up if we apply a high frequency magnetic field. So that is shown here. In this case, the gradient fields of MPI are turned on and an imaging was performed at 20 kilohertz. This is a typical AC field used in MPI, a relatively low frequency AC field, it does not heat any of the nanoparticles. The frequency is so low, it doesn't cause any heating. So that is shown over here. No heating, but we get the MPI image. Then we can say, okay, there are nanoparticles over there. And then the gradients are turned off, and the very high frequency, relatively high frequency, uh, magnetic field at 354 kilohertz is applied. Now all of these nanoparticles are going to heat up. But do we really want that to happen? Yes, there were nanoparticles in tumor, we want to heat them up, but there were a lot of nanoparticles in liver as well, so we would be damaging the liver if we heat up uh, all the nanoparticles everywhere. So what is done in this next column is the gradients of the MPI scanner are turned on and the field free point is positioned on top of the tumor. Now only the nanoparticles at the field free point can heat up when a high frequency magnetic field is applied. All the other nanoparticles are saturated, there is no way they are going to respond to this high frequency AC field. So that is shown here, tumor, the temperature in tumor increases rapidly, whereas all the other places, such as even this large amount of iron in liver, it does not show any change in temperature. An important point here is the initial MPI image is your guide about how much uh, temperature increase there will be in a given location after hyperthermia. Uh, it's interesting that the first ever focused hyperthermia study was actually proposed in Mikan uh, by Erwin Atalar. Uh, this shows a typical MPI scanner, but there, were, there was no imaging involved in this case actually. Uh, this has nothing to do with MPI, but it used the exact same topology, uh, showing that they could perform uh, focused hyperthermia in any given location, in this case on the tail of a mouse. Uh, the tail had been injected with iron oxide nanoparticles. Yet another application that was shown was uh, drug release monitoring with MPI. In this case, iron oxide nanoparticles uh, were, put to the, were placed in the same core shell as uh, doxorubicin, which is a chemotherapy drug. And this is then inserted in the human body. And what happens is in mild acidic environment, the shell uh, of this structure decomposes, and once it decomposes, the drug is being released onto the tumor. At the same time, the nan nanoparticles also become more free. When they are more free, when they are freer, free more free. Anyway, when, when they have more freedom to move, uh, the signal from the nanoparticles also increase. So what that means is as the drug is being released, the signal from the nanoparticles increase linearly at the same time. So you could monitor whether the drug is being released at a given location. So here imaging has been done in about 48 hours. The MPI signal uh, increases with time. And that means at the same time there was more and more drug being released. Let me skip this slide. One of the evolving applications, and this is the last application I will mention, of MPI is the color MPI. Uh, so these nanoparticles, different nanoparticles, respond differently to the applied magnetic field. Uh, using these differences that it was proposed, maybe we could distinguish different nanoparticles. Um, so this has been first 
proposed using system function reconstruction. So they performed calibration scans for, let's say, three different nanoparticle types. Each of the calibration scan takes about maybe 20 hours, 24 hours. But in the end, you have a much bigger system matrix. You are solving uh, a bigger inverse problem, essentially. Uh, but then you could distinguish the signal coming from different nanoparticles. Now, why is this useful? Uh, because maybe uh, we want to distinguish nanoparticles inside healthy tissue versus disease tissue. Is their signal changing depending on the environment that they are in? Or some of the nanoparticles may be bound to drugs, as in the example that I have shown, and some may be free nanoparticles. So can I distinguish between these two nanoparticles? Can I separate their images? Um, so these types of applications are also emerging. In the coming slides, I will present, one of the things that I will present is our approach for color MPI, which does not require any calibration scan whatsoever. So I want to talk about um, our progress uh, in MPI uh, in my lab at the National Magnetic Resonance Research Center of the Kent, Umbram. Uh, first, we started by building what is called a magnetic particle uh, relaxometer. So this relaxometer uh, essentially characterizes the signal of the nanoparticles. It doesn't do any in imaging, but it tells us how a specific nanoparticle performs at a given frequency. Uh, but the response of the nanoparticles are delayed with respect to the applied field. So if you are sweeping the field free point this way, you would expect the nanoparticles to give this uh, red response as a function of time, but uh, they will be delayed uh, as they cannot immediately align to the external magnetic. One of the things that affect this delay is the viscous drag, meaning that the nanoparticles can actually sense the viscosity of the medium around them. Uh, so we wanted to detect um, the relaxation uh, behavior as a time constant for the relaxation. What is the effective relaxation time constant? Meaning tau, a tau equals zero means instantaneous alignment with the applied field. Large tau means a very large delay. Uh, so what we have realized is if you uh, scan the same point uh, in space, back and forth, back and forth, the signal that we get from the nanoparticles uh, should be something like that is shown in the blue curve over here. This is when you are scanning forward and this is when you are scanning backward. They normally have a mirror symmetry behavior because I'm scanning the same point. But if there is a relaxation, the signal will be delayed uh, in both of these cases. Now, when you take this negative signal and flip it back, without relaxation, these two should overlap perfectly, but in the case of relaxation, now they are separated. So by using this principle then, uh, with some uh, equations in Fourier domain, uh, we have found a way to directly estimate the time constant from this observed uh, signal, time domain signal, without any calibration necessary. And so we have performed some experiments on our MPS setup uh, to show that with this technique of estimating the time constant, uh, we could distinguish viscosity of the environment that the nanoparticles were placed in. Here in these experiments, uh, the x-axis is the viscosity uh, where of the environment where the nanoparticles are placed, y-axis is the estimated time constant using the technique that I've just described. We have performed experiments at different frequencies because we don't know which frequency would be more suitable for viscosity mapping in MPI and different field amplitudes, AC field amplitudes. Uh, what we are looking for is a one-to-one -one mapping between viscosity and the estimated time constant so that if we measure the time constant then we can say, oh, then the viscosity must be equal to this value essentially. Uh, we see that we see that that is uh, best achieved at around 1.1 kilohertz. In this case, there is almost a one-to-one -one relationship here. These are very high viscosity levels, by the way, not seen uh, in the human body, even in disease tissue. It's typically somewhere from one to five millipascal seconds. So this range is the most important range for us. Uh, interestingly, this frequency, 1.1 kilohertz, is so far off from the current. MPI systems that are being built, they typically operate around 
20 to 25 kilohertz. Uh, so this means that if we move to lower frequencies, we can have additional information coming from the nanoparticles. And the second thing we have done was after building the MPS system was we built, it, uh, built the first generation MPI scanner at Umrah. And this has a field free point topology, 4.8 Tesla per meter selection field free. Yeah, this is a prototype system, so the imaging uh, volume was relatively small. It had a 1 centimeter diameter and 10 centimeter length. Uh, the purpose for building this scanner was we have been developing techniques uh, such as the time constant estimation technique and additional image reconstruction techniques. Uh, we wanted to show proof of concept experimental validations for those techniques that we have been developing. This was one of the first ever MPI images we got with this system, uh, showing two different vials containing nanoparticles. This was the corresponding MPI image. Uh, inside of this scanner, there are two uh, disk magnets. Uh, they, are, they will be facing each other with their north poles, creating a field free point. An important part of the system for those who are interested in hardware is um, a transmission and reception happens simultaneously in MPI, and this creates one of the biggest challenges. You are trying to receive signal while exciting, so uh, the drive field, the excitation field that you are applying, feeds through to the inductive receive coil, and it generates a signal that's million times larger than the signal you are expecting from the nanoparticles. Uh, so that means you have to somehow cancel out this direct feed through signal. So what is typically done and what we have also done is uh, you use a receive coil that is wound in the shape of a radiometer so that it cancels out the signal from the excitation coil. You place your sample somewhere in here. It can still receive signal from the center, but these two parts compensate for the signal coming from the center. Hopefully you will get rid of the direct feature. And this is the finalized MPI scanner. Uh, we moved the field free point in space globally uh, using a robotic arm mechanical motion. And at the same time, we apply an excitation field and receive our signal. Uh, we have demonstrated our setup, uh, first of all, for the purposes of a robust image reconstruction technique with, that we have proposed for MPI. In addition to the direct feed through signal uh, coming from the excitation frequency, there are also ha harmonics of that signal that leak into your uh, nanoparticle signal. And all of those things make the image reconstruction very susceptible uh, to errors. This is the standard X space reconstruction performed on the signal that we get from our scanner. So remember, our scanner is not a commercial MPI scanner. So is a relatively cheap system. It is prone to any types of errors, small errors, that would require a lot of engineering efforts uh, before it could become a commercial system. So we have these errors, So and many other research laboratories have similar errors. What can be done to still get a high quality MPI image was the goal of this study. And so we have proposed a sampling scheme, essentially, uh, which samples the signal periodically at the positions that we know are less susceptible to interferences, such that we can get a much cleaner MPI image in this case. There were three different nanoparticle uh, samples there, which are better resolved in the reconstruction that we have proposed. We have also demonstrated our uh, calibration free color MPI technique on our scanner. Uh, here, showing the time constants that we have estimated for three different types of nanoparticles. Actually, in this case, two different types of nanoparticles, vibrotrex and nanomagnet nanoparticles, and their homogeneous mixture, mixture. These were the time constants estimated blindly, without any knowledge about the underlying nanoparticles. Uh, so we can get an MPI image that shows concentration, and on top of that, we can distinguish uh, different types of nanoparticles, and the homogeneous mixture shows a time constant that's almost the mean of the other two. We have also performed viscosity mapping with our scanner. And previously we had demonstrated this on our MPS setup, but 
but this time we can turn that into an image uh, of the viscosity uh, at different positions in space. So here we have created a fountain that contains different samples at different uh, viscosity environments. Uh, again, we didn't know the ideal operating frequency for performing this imaging. Our MPS uh, experiments showed 1.1 kilohertz was uh, promising, but we don't know if they will translate to an MPI system. So we performed the experiments in MPI. Interestingly, the ideal frequency now changed to around 10 kilohertz in the MPI system. The addition of uh, the selection field, the static field, changes the, uh, the behavior of the non particle. So the ideal frequency for one to one dipping between viscosity and time constant shift, shifted to around 10 kilohertz. And this next image is an experiment at 10 kilohertz, uh, performed on the same phantom. You can see the MPI image showing the five different phantoms we have. The time constant now clearly demonstrates these nanoparticles were in different environments uh, at different viscosity levels. And why is viscosity so important? I should have mentioned that initially, actually. Uh, so viscosity uh, in, in tumor tissue, the vis local viscosity is known to be much higher than the healthy tissue. So if we can distinguish the response of the nanoparticles based on viscosity, hopefully we can tell if they are in a tumor or in healthy tissue. Uh, very recently, just um, a few weeks ago, we have demonstrated temperature mapping with our color MPI technique. Um, so here I want to show only this column. Uh, so there were four different samples. This one had the same uh, nanoparticle sample as that one, the same composition. This one had the same composition as, as this one. But we have heated up these two to around 35 degrees Celsius. What we see in the corresponding MPI image is that the time constant increases when the um, temperature increases. Um, so we can detect temperature changes with this method. When you increase the temperature, what happens at the same time is the viscosity of the medium goes down. There is this relationship between viscosity and temperature. So we have to be careful about this. And there is a confounding effect of temperature and viscosity. So this experiment was designed such that this sample, when heated up, would have the same viscosity as the second sample. So what we are seeing is, despite having the same viscosity, um, the temperature difference was sufficient to distinguish them in terms of their time constants. Um, coming to what we have been doing very recently is, uh, we have been working on a second generation MPI scanner in our lab. Uh, the purpose of this second scanner is that it will be suitable for preclinical imaging, meaning that we want to move on to in vivo imaging on mouse, uh, if possible. Our previous system was very small, had only one centimeter diameter, you cannot fit a mouse in there, but this new generation scanner has 4.5 centimeter uh, free bore diameter. Um, and also it has some additional uh, hardware novelties as well. Uh, it has a swappable configuration, so it can swap between field-free point topology to field-free line topology. I have not talked about the field-free line topology, but it's actually, it works like this. Previously, I have shown that when we have two magnets at the center, we have a field-free point. Imagine making these two magnets much, much longer, as shown in this example, much longer magnets. What happens to your field-free point is that it stretches in space as you make the magnets bigger. It turns into a field-free line. So in it, instead of getting signal from a single point in space, now you will get signal from an entire line, which means you will be doing projection format imaging. We will get projections along this vertical dimension. And that will allow a much quicker uh, imaging for MPI. What we propose in our setup is, uh, first of all, we have this field-free line topology. Uh, they will get projection images along the Y direction, but we have inserted an additional swap coil in there. When you turn on this coil, you can rotate the field-free point onto the X, field-free line, sorry, onto the X axis. So you can get one projection along Y, then turn on swap coil, one projection along X, then we change the directions of the coil, uh, 
the entire topology turns into a field-free point topology, so you could do point by point volumetric imaging with that topology. The purpose for this was similar to anyone working on MRI will know. Um, there are localizer scans uh, that are performed. When you first go into an MRI scanner, they don't know where your brain is, so they perform a very quick localizer scan, and then they say, okay, this is where the brain is, let's do higher resolution imaging around that point. So these projection format scans will serve as our localizer scan. We will determine where the uh, region of interest is. Then we will turn on the field free point mode and the volumetric imaging. And this, is, this is the swap coil. They will perform that. Uh, if you run turns in opposing directions on the swap coil, and this turns the field free line from y axis down to x axis. So initially it's along the y-axis when there is no current on these coils. If you apply a relatively large coil, 63 amperes, the line turns onto the x-axis. Again, coming back to the original configuration, now run the current in the reverse direction. Previously they were going this way and that way. Now both are reversed. If you increase the current amplitude in this case, uh, the topology turns into a field-free point volumetric imaging topology. This is a simulation uh, showing the principle of this scanner. Let's say we have a phantom like this. Imagine nanoparticles are filled in this phantom that's made of three layers. Projection along X should look something like this, ideally. Along Y should look something like this. We have performed simulations using the magnetic fields of our scanner. If all the fields were ideal, we should get this signal. This is blurred by the system response because we are doing a space reconstruction. And with the specifications of our scanner, we, we, will, we hope we will get something very similar to that ideal image. And this is projection along the x-axis after turning on the swap coil. Ideally, the image should look like this. Ours look, will look, hopefully, very close to that. And then we can turn on the FFP mode and perform individual layer-by-layer -layer, uh, imaging. Putting together these magnets have been extremely challenging. Um, there are forces ex ex exceeding 2,500 newtons. Uh, first of all, the body of the scanner has to withstand these forces. So a very special material called G10 was used. Uh, it can stand all of these forces, but still pushing the magnets into their place was it took months, I would say. A car jack was implemented like this. My students were pushing, pushing, five people pushing at the same time. And then eventually, let me go back and show that again, since it took so much time. Uh, they, they were able to construct these. All of these things you see were a result of them hammering it into the scanner, hammering all the um, magnets into the scanner. But now, the static part of the scanner has been completed, so hopefully, we will get an image in the next few months. Before I finish, I want to quickly mention that we have an ongoing collaboration with Lasatsan uh, as part of our uh, 2 plus 2 Turkish Germany project. Um, we have collaborated with a university in Germany uh, and a company um, called Nano for Imaging that makes uh, guide wires and stands to be used in MRI. Uh, now they are trying to extend these guide wires so they can be used in MPI and we are working on the rapid imaging side of this uh, project. The goal is to develop MPI as a safe and rapid interventional imaging technique. One of the things we have proposed there was uh, addressing how long it takes to uh, acquire the system matrix for system function reconstruction. I mentioned that it takes over 24 hours. So we have proposed that we can use what is called a coded calibration scene. Instead of placing the nanoparticle at the signal position and acquiring the response from that position only, we can have a scene like this. Nanoparticles are distributed randomly and you get the response from this scene. Uh, and then you change your scene and perform another calibration scan. Each scene will have randomly distributed nanoparticles. Uh, we have shown that this can reduce the calibration time by tenfold at least. Uh, obviously, this may not be very practical changing scenes every time you perform a calibration scan.
So we have also proposed an extension of it. Imagine you have channels filled with nanoparticles like this. You can rotate the single scene and slide it in space in between each calibration measurement. It also performs equally well, similar to random distribution. Uh, we have compared this with uh, standard compressed sensing under sampling of uh, calibration matrix, and we have shown that um, even in the case of tenfold acceleration, which is this column here, standard compressed sensing really fails to resolve these uh, nanoparticle distributions here. All of the techniques, different versions of the coded calibration scene that we have proposed perform really well, even under tenfold acceleration. So in conclusion, MPI is a rapidly developing uh, new medical imaging modality and it already has an array of potential applications that have been shown in mice. Um, MPI promises high resolution imaging and sensitivity. Importantly, it does this without using any ionizing radiation. So uh, hopefully one day it will be able to replace uh, some of the applications of positron emission tomography so we can get the same information without using any radioactive materials on humans. Uh, we, we have also shown that uh, MPI has different con contrast mechanisms so it doesn't just provide the distribution of the nanoparticles, it can give you additional information about the environment that these nanoparticles